Hey, this is Taylor with a quick note. This is the final episode of The Dog is Dead. Stick around to the end for an announcement about what's next. Now, on to the show. The Dog is Dead? That's what it's called. It's not all there. You shout to her from across the massive living room, into the massive kitchen. And my god, what a huge old house her Uncle Jeff has. You click a button and turn on the fireplace. It's electric and marvel. In the three years you've been with Paris, she's never mentioned this place. But with her going back to school, it's been hard to spend time together. And it's a good way to make some extra money. Watching his house while he's away for the Christmas break seemed like a great time to get away. God knows you need it. You read the description of the movie from the TV aloud to her. How it's about some dragon who becomes a jester, you don't know. She comes back in to sit with you, hot cocos in hand. You flip through the options. There's a memorial documentary of the bridge bombing. Every season of Agent Aussie Joe. How old is that show? There's some black and white movie about pirates. You both can't pick anything in spite of the options. It doesn't matter, you think. Let's watch literally anything. You feel an argument coming on and would actually like to have it now. It's been brewing for a while, so you bring up the topic of doing something new. She takes this personally, though you meant with her. You haven't broached the topic, but your Christmas present is two plane tickets and a trip. You're sick of doing the same thing and feel like you're in a rut, and she takes this as being sick of her. She says it doesn't sound like you want adventure. It sounds like you want options. Before you can retort, there's a knock at the door, and an old man, probably in his 80s, opens it without a response. He leaves the door open, a slice of pizza in his hand, and an open box of pizza in the other. You get up to close the door, since it's cold, and he apologizes, saying he knows Jeff is gone, but he stops over every night for pizza, and is sure Jeff wouldn't mind, even on Christmas Eve. He's just a good neighbor. You want to ask him to leave, to keep the other conversation going, but she invites him in and he sits on the couch between you two, looking at the TV. Oh, he says, there's a documentary about this new artificial intelligence. Oh, look, it's that superhero show. And she says, yeah, that's based on a comic her friend made. You shoot eyes at her, but she asks more about his life, avoiding the problem. You request to talk to her in the kitchen, and she says she wants to stay and listen to this nice man. And so you huff out past the kitchen to the patio area. You yell back and say, it's important, and he can stay there and watch whatever he wants. She follows you and you close the door, shivering on the patio. Where's this going? What do you want? You don't want to spoil your present, but this is absurd. Why is she more concerned with talking to this guy? She says he's obviously lonely, don't you understand? You accuse her of purposefully ignoring the issue. She says you've been ignoring issues. She's been trying and hesitant to tell you, but it's things with her mom, and she's really worried, and the rehab isn't working, and yeah, her mom's across the state, but she just needs to spend more time with her. She's asking you to be involved. It's not unreasonable. You care about her mom, obviously. You don't tell her this, but having another person, another distraction, what's that going to do to you all? You say, what are you, what are you doing about things together? About how you're already strained enough just to get a week and you're watching a stranger's house, for God's sakes. You feel trapped, and it's turning from arguing to yelling. So if she wants to hang out with the old pizza neighbor and watch some stupid movie about a dragon, go ahead. This was supposed to be about us. You huff off the porch, around the side of the house, and walk through this crummy, opulent neighborhood alone. You see some carolers and give them a nod, but they ask you to join them. You feel so dumb singing about peace on earth and all that, and after one house where nobody comes out, you slip away. You just need some time to think, and you walk around for a bit. You look at all these huge old houses, and feel claustrophobic. You want adventure. You're both 29, and you should be open to making big changes, not stuck in boring suburban decisions. Look at these monstrous homes. You bet if these people get robbed, they wouldn't even notice. You loop back around the cul-de-sac, and the carolers are helping some family reverse their RV, and they ask you to help again. What is it with people in Christmas cheer? You pull out your phone and call her. Now that you've been gone for a bit, maybe too long. There's no response. On to voicemail. Come on. 
You leave a voicemail when explaining how you feel, and maybe you think too differently and have different ideas of what you want from this. It's a bad decision. You should just go talk to her. You trudge back to the house and hear an ambulance and see it turn the corner into the driveway of her uncle's house. You run up the driveway, the paramedics rush out of the ambulance and ask if you made the call, but she opens the front door and motions. He's in here, he's unconscious. The old man. She was calling 911. They load him in and she volunteers to sit in the back because she talked to him and knows a little bit, and you have to decide if you're going and dealing with this now. You make eye contact with her. So we're doing this? The medics have to go now. There's one spot up front. You're not allowed in the back. There's no time to think, so you sit up front with the driver. You're in the passenger seat of the ambulance, and she's helping out the medics and comforting the old man. And in the back of your mind, you hope she doesn't look at her phone. She doesn't need this right now. You can't imagine being alone in that house, watching someone collapse, having to call for help. You should have been there, not sulking around the neighborhood. You try and talk to the ambulance driver, but he's focused, going through the suburb, doesn't give you an inch. You'd message her, but you don't want her to look at her phone and see the voicemail there. You ask if you can radio into the back, or if they can just let you talk to them, but the driver is stone cold. You berate him under your breath, and he mentions how they keep the less stable people in front, and they made the right choice. Man, what a jerk. What is it with people and their lack of Christmas cheer? It gets you worried because you don't know what's going on, and he says not to bother him. You tell him to stop the ambulance, and he says he can't, and how dare you? You feel trapped even more so than in that giant house or in this winding neighborhood, and this is the last place you want to be on Christmas Eve. You unroll the window and yank your head out, but duh, there's no windows on the side of the ambulance. You try slapping the side of the vehicle even more frustrated, but he yanks you back in. You try and knock on the panel behind you in the cab, but it's covered for privacy, and he won't let you slide it open. At the stop sign, you open the door and jump out, but they don't stop, and they drive off. You run down the block, back to your car at her uncle's giant house, and speed to the hospital. At the emergency entrance, you see the doors to an ambulance fling open, and you park and sprint up. When you get to them, she's there beside the gurney, smiling, joking, having a grand old time. She says the man fainted, and he thinks it's because of not taking medicine. They laugh about the pizza, though, and you think, how can she be so flippant? The medics recognize you. They ask you to follow them to security, and they escort you and her into the waiting room. You get up to the desk, and they shove papers into your hands. Paris pulls you aside and tells you she signed you off as kin, because he whispered he doesn't want to be alone. They already knew she wasn't family, and it's great you flipped out in the front seat, because now the story about how much you care for him as a son checks out. She winks and smiles, clearly enjoying all of this. You have to stay there until he's cleared with the tests for whatever happened. You're stuck in this waiting room. You just want to talk to her about what happened back at the house, but some lady in all pink sits beside you. Oh my god, it's Mrs. Simmons, the old bus driver, she says. You don't trust somebody in all pink, or recognize this woman, because she wasn't your bus driver. But Paris shouts and beams, and they hug, and she asks you to scoot over as they talk like old friends. How does she know so many people in this town, and in the hospital, on Christmas Eve? Feels like she's avoiding you. You just want to get out of here. Shouldn't you be watching the house? You ask her about leaving the waiting room, but now Paris is playing hide-and-seek with a little kid, pretending not to notice him under the legs of a chair. She makes the silly excuse about how you can't just leave, because then he's going to be hidden forever. She smiles and says how much more fun this is than watching some dragon becoming a jester, eh? And it is fun because she's here. She says she's glad you're here, and that your dad, winking about the old man, is probably going to be okay. She asks if you can help find the kid, and a nurse says you can go see your father in this room in the Trevor wing. Paris points out how cool this semi-empty hospital is, wheeling a cart that clearly isn't for her to wheel. You're almost upset because you need to start the conversation again, but she seems so comfortable here. She goes to hide, running around the corner, <laughs> giggling. You stare at the sign for the Trevor Wing, and how nobody knows how these things get named. You read the plaque on the wall, and want to tell Paris the story about it. You creep around the halls, looking for her, 
and then actually forget the room number to go to. A nurse confronts you, asking what room you're looking for, or what's the patient's name, and you don't remember that either. Paris army crawls from under a gurney and saves you, grabbing your hand, and you head down the hall. She peers into the old man's room, but you pause her and say you have to talk. She starts before you can. She's sorry if this is ruining your Christmas Eve, but you know her best friend, right? And there was this thing that happened to her as a little kid, and it's just very important to her to be with people when they're alone. You don't know what she's talking about. Before you can ask, she says, hold on, and she answers her phone. She says, hi, Mom. Merry Christmas Eve. Well, now Merry Christmas, and walks away, shooing you into the room. You step inside, and there's the old guy laying there. You sit next to him, and he watches TV, joking about how it was just the medicine, or maybe he eats too much pizza. But Jeff likes it. He rambles about that house in the neighborhood, now he's lived there his whole life and seen so many people come and go from that big house. There was one couple that moved a long time ago, or the lady did. They were really on the ropes. But it doesn't look like you are, eh? Paris comes back in the room, her face blank. You know what's coming. You ask if it's about her mom, and of course you know the answer. It's about you. You say you didn't mean it, you were walking around not thinking right, and it's from the past. But she says it's what you thought a few hours ago. People don't change that fast. And since you're so worried about time, maybe you can take some. Don't drive her, and she's going to get a cab. And she's gone. Is this what you wanted? Is this an adventure worth having? She cares about everyone so much. Maybe you don't care about anything at all. Maybe you're the one ignoring the issue. You stay quiet, the stupid old man and the TV, and watch some stupid movie about a stupid dragon. After it's all over, he turns the TV off and looks at you. He asks what you're doing. You say you need some time. He says, no you don't. He's been in that neighborhood his whole life. He thought he needed time. Just move on, go and do something crazy. He had options. He says, then this guy Jeff moved in. Sexy, rich man. Paris's uncle, you say. It's been three glorious decades, he says from when it wasn't okay and they had to sneak out like little kids, and even when things got tough between them. He says he thought about taking time and got scared by all the effort it would take to find someone else again. But he realized something, he says, and he looks at you. It's not about the effort. <laughs> You've always got options, he says. But I don't love the options. I don't even love pizza. I love him. He pats you on the shoulder. Now get the hell out of here, he says, and smiles, turning the TV back on. You get to your car and drive all night. You're not sure if this will work, or even where it is. You've got to, though, before you see Paris. When you get to the place, you don't know what to say. The ride back from where you went is quiet and long, and it's taken all night. And now it's Christmas morning, and you hope Paris is still at the house. You sit in the car in the driveway and call her. You tell her that you're sorry, but that you're with another woman. But you'll just hand the phone off and let her mom talk now. Her mom says hi, and Paris can't believe it. We're out front, actually, you say. <laughs> Paris comes outside and hugs her mom. But she lives so far away. How'd you get here? They let her leave? Oh yeah, that place is a mess. She needs her family, you say. I pretended to be her son. I'm pretty good at that. You say Merry Christmas, and that you want them to have this. And go now before the semester starts up again. And you hand them the plane tickets, because you promise her. We'll have enough adventures when you two get back. Paris smiles and says she can't possibly, and she asks, what are you going to do? You say not to worry. You'll be here. 
there's plenty of stuff on TV. Thanks so much for listening. The Dog is Dead is written by me, Taylor Zablowski, at a table in the public library, recorded under a blanket in my closet, and edited in a fast food restaurant booth with the nearest power outlet. There will be one more part coming soon, explaining all the connections and timeline for the episodes, because if you haven't heard anything about it yet, every episode is intertwined as part of one big universe. Go back and listen through if you'd like, and see if you can spot how each of them fits together. Anyways, thanks again for listening, and be on the lookout for that final epilogue soon. <laughs>